Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest A.H. Almas, who's here to share with us his new book, Non Dual Love Awakening to the Loving Nature of Reality. So, is love a transformative aspect of the spiritual path? Today, A.H. Almas is going to share with us just that. A.H. Almas is the pen name for Hamid Ali, the Kuwaiti-born originator of the Diamond Approach, who has been guiding individuals and groups in the U.S. since 1976. Over time, the teachings have found a home in Europe, Canada, Australia, and beyond. Hamid is the author of many books, including Love Unveiled, The Unfolding Now, and The Runaway Realization. So welcome to the show, Hamid Ali. Hey, Marianne. What an honor it is to have you here to talk about your new book, Non-Dual Love. So Hamid, a lot of people, when we talk about non-duality, there seems to be a lot of confusion around that, around that topic. Can you explain for our listeners who are new to this topic what that means? Well, it's becoming a popular term. Many people using these days. Many teachers calling themselves non-dual teachers. Most of the time when people say non-dual these days, they mean just spiritual. I mean, instead of saying spiritual, they say non-dual. However, the word non-dual in in various traditions means a particular way of experiencing reality where the subject and the object are not separate from each other so it's uh, non-dual means no no dual no self and object the two are inseparable so non-dual really basically means seeing reality as nothing separate from each other because everything is consciousness or everything is you know awareness so it's, everything is one unified fabric that has many uh, forms and shapes and colors, and that's called non-dual experience. And that's really the classical meaning of non-dual, and that's w- w- what I mean in the, in my book about non-dual love. So what was the, and thank you for taking the time to explain that. I think that's probably one of the best explanations I've heard of that. Um, why don't you share a little bit about the inspiration for writing this book? Well, there are very, several different things. I've written many books about my teaching, which I call the Diamond Approach. And although I discuss love in different ways, I never written specifically a book about love. So I wanted to present the teaching of uh, my teaching about love so that People recognize there is a uh, you know a deep and wide teaching about love, not just about many other things like presence and consciousness and and spiritual nature. And the other reason is uh, what many people know as love is emotional love. They don't know love when it's essential or spiritual form that is the ground of emotional love because human beings care about love. Everybody wants love. Everybody wants to love or want to be loved. And all. So love is pervades the human society throughout history. But the love that is implied in spiritual teaching is a different kind of love. It is the very essence and the very nature of love before it is expressed and uh, and relationship and uh, relation to others. Before one says, I love you, one feels first experiences, what is the love in their heart? It's not just a feeling of appreciation, it is a kind of presence, it's a kind of beingness, it's, it's a medium of uh, spiritual nature that has a sweetness, it has a goodness, it has a, you know, a realness, truthfulness that is independent of time, independent of history. And that then shows what real love is. So that I wanted to make that clear. The other reason is that many spiritual teachers write about love, like Rumi, for instance, uh, poetry is all about love. 
So Rumi wrote, talks about love a lot. He rarely actually gets to describe what is the direct experience of love itself. Not what it does. He talks a lot about what love makes us do, what makes us feel, and its, it's impact and effect on us, and how it makes us drunk, this and that. But what's, it, what's the feel of it? What's the experience? He doesn't get into that. So I'm, this book is a contribution toward all the literature about love to bring in the very the exp, direct experience of the very essence of love. What's it feel like? What's it like? What does it mean to experience love that is before it affects us, before it uh, impacts us, or before we express it? And that is mean recognizing that love is one way of experiencing our spiritual nature. That, that, that is one purpose of writing about it. In your book, you talk about how when we go beyond the individual soul, it requires some fundamental shifts in our perception. What did you mean by that? We perceive things according to physical reality. I mean, there are objects, there are cars and chairs and trees and mountains, skies and birds and things, and each one is its own thing separate from the other. So the perception needs to change so that we see these are simply manifestation out of the same fabric of reality. It's just like waves in the ocean or eddies in the ocean. That is what makes it non-dual. So it is not about love specifically, it's about non-dual love, because love doesn't have to be non-dual. I wrote my first book about love was uh, Love Unveiled, was about love that is experienced before we experience non-dual love, as I call personal or individual love. But for non-dual love, our, our capacity for perception need to change, which means we recognize uh, something about ourselves that we are not only individual beings, but we are also part of the fabric of reality. Very well said. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, and you have so much in your book that I don't know if we even have enough time for a small portion of it here today. But one thing that stuck out to me, you talk about ownership of experience. And I'd like to know what you mean by that. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> because it's normal for a human being to say, it's my experience. I experienced this, or uh, this is my perception. And ownership means there's an individual ownership. Like me as an individual human being have this experience. It's my experience. or and this is my perception. In non-duality, in non-dual perception, there's no individual there to own it. There is only pure, uh, vast ocean of being or spiritual nature. So no individual owns it. It's it always the expression of the infinite ocean of being, and in this case, love. So ownership is, if we still feel we, it is ours, my love, my heart, individually, that make it not possible for us to go to the non-dual level of experience. So when we open our soul to divine love, what are some things we'll experience there? Well, first you experience divine love itself. What's it like? It's basically is experiencing the heart or one's love as not within the chest, but as uh, unbounded, not bounded by our skin. We experience a medium, soft, gentle, uh, medium of inherent goodness. It feels like a kind of beingness. Uh, when I say medium, it's like substance, almost like a subtle substance, a very delicate substance that has a softness, that has a gentleness. 
the golden color usually, beautiful, shiny, golden color. And it we see it as pervading the whole universe, pervading the body, pervading the mind, pervading the heart, pervading the, st- the environment, pervading the whole universe, and underlying everything. That is divine love. It is the love, it's like the, the love of the divine, like God's heart, sort of. God's heart embraces the whole universe. So we experience that, and the divine love then can express many things, can come through a human being. We know it comes through an individual human being, usually. But the individual human being is not a separate human being, an object apart from divine love, apart from from the heart of God, but as a channel through which this divine expresses itself in the world of particulars. It's a really a deep state of uh, spirituality. It's not an easy one to experience. One has to have worked a lot on their ego identification and recognize they are not their ego. They are something else that makes it possible to open to this realm of experience, which is the realm of beauty, the realm of light. Uh, realm of goodness, but goodness inherent. And I mean, that's, that's one reason I also wrote this book is seeing that in this world these days, love is lost, not much love around the world. There is a lot of discord, a lot of trouble, different kind. And I think if people recognize the love inherent to each one of us, that the love really pervades the whole universe. If we have access, if we are open to it, if we take a moment to challenge ourselves and not uh, take ourselves to be the usual uh, individual we think we are and go beyond that and experience love, that will be tremendous help for the whole world. You know, I mean, that is one purpose of the book and um, hopefully it could contribute to that I don't know how many people will, will be able to do it but if you manage to learn it from the book I'll be happy there's so much wisdom in this book I I can't see people not reading this and picking things up that will improve their life in your book you talk about dimming the light and how that will really kind of affect our perception I'd love for you to expand on that. Yeah, well, what happened to mo- most of us, which is a natural process, is as we grow up, the light of our spiritual nature is dimmed slowly by our various experiences and encounters with situation, many of them conflictual or difficult or challenging. That makes our consciousness, be- it, it, uh, makes it want to defend, protect itself against uh, insult, against hurt, against abuse, against difficulty. And that uh, natural process, which is really for survival, is needed for physical survival. As we do that, we thicken our consciousness. As we thicken our consciousness, the light of our spiritual nature doesn't have the opportunity to shine through. So it dims slowly. And tends to various degrees for different individuals, depending on their opportunities in their life, their history, how much love they had in their childhood, and you know how much how which means how open their heart is, or how close, how defended. So the defended heart means. Uh, Love is being dimmed. The light is being dimmed. Because love and light are two sides of the same thing. That's why sometimes I call divine love as a loving light. It is like love and it is light, but it is, has a substantial quality to it. Meaning it is not just a feeling. It is not just a, a thought. It is something, a medium that pervades our experience, we feel it as a palpable thing. And that gets them for everybody. And then some people have the opportunity 
or their heart to open up through one mean or another. You know, that's what spiritual teachings are for, and basically, is to open our consciousness, including our heart, so we can experience uh, the light of our uh, light of the divine, or you call the light of our being, or the light of spirit. And the more light, the more we understand ourselves, the more we are authentically ourselves, the more we are authentic in the world, the more we are good and bring goodness to the world. In your book, you share about how when we explore divine love, the diamond approach ha- helps us to create a new perspective. And what would that look like? Well, because that approach is the name of the teaching I teach. So that approach has its own way of working with the obstacles or uh, or the what dims the love, what dims the light. And the way that approach works with it is to first uh, be open to what are the ways we learn to defend ourselves, to protect ourselves against hurt, to protect our heart from feeling wounded. And all the ways, which a lot of them has to do with experiences we've had in the past. And exploring that, recognizing them, bringing them to the light of awareness, feeling them, feeling the hurt, feeling the situation, feeling the insult, feeling the anger or the hatred, or whatever it is that comes with it, feeling it and understanding what's it about, what makes me feel that way. And that understanding, which means experiential, by feeling, sensing, and seeing the meaning of something, seeing where it comes from, what's it connected to, I call that understanding. This experiential understanding, when it happens, that barrier or that occlusion or that thickening will soften, will begin to dissolve. That way, clearing the way for the light to shine through. So that, it is, that is the particular methodology that uh, I have developed. I call it inquiry, which is inquiring into our experience, ourself from moment to moment. So it is a slightly different meditation. and I, I use meditation, all of that. But the main primary method is an exploration of our experience in a direct, immediate way by feeling it, getting into it, embracing it, and open, being open to whatever it is and not trying to change it, but more interested, more interested in what is its truth? What's it really about? Where does it come from? How does it affect me? This are kind of exploration. Most people don't bother to do that with their experience. They just experience it, and they think that's how they experience things, and that's it. For me, it's no. This is the beginning of the story. Our experience is the entry into the inner realms because it is the outer expression of them. And it is it comes through after many barriers, after many dimmings, after many defend, defenses and ways of defending oneself, protecting oneself. And because we now we're protecting ourselves against our own feelings, not against our other people, our own heart. We close our heart because we don't want to feel something we feel that happened in the past. And it's not easy, but it is possible. And with the right guidance, with the right uh, support, we can engage that kind of um, process of exploration, which is really an adventure into our subjectivity, adventure into our own heart. And it, it is a challenging adventure, but it is an adventure, meaning it could be exciting, could be scary, it could be rewarding, it could be sublime, it has all the element of adventure. But it is a contemplative exploration of our experience, so that experience will relieve itself of the layers or the veils that cover the light, that cover the love. That way the love has the opportunity to come through and we could experience it directly 
in our heart. As people are working with you, what is an area that they tend to get stuck in as they move into the light? People come in different places. Everybody's different. But when it comes around love, many of the things that people experience is how they were not loved, feeling not being loved or feeling not loved enough, or they were loved and then they were dropped, or they were abandoned, or wounding in love, that they loved somebody and the person betrayed them or uh, rejected them. So there's a lot of wounds, a lot of hurts in the way of love. That's about love itself. Non-dual love, the other thing people bring in, is their sense of feeling isolated, separate uh, from the world, separate from others, sort of uh, like uh, as if surrounded by a thick shell. And uh, and that is there's a way of working with all of these, but these are the kind of thing people present. But as I said, everybody have their own history, their own character, so they bring in different things. But most of it is around the heart when we're dealing with the question of love. The people it's like they're not in asking about how smart I am or how effective I am in doing something. They're talking about their heart usually when we're dealing with love. I would think that that's very difficult for some people, and especially in the West, a lot of people have their hearts closed off, especially during this time. So to open it, I can understand how that would be scary. It will be very scary. So part of what people have to go through is the fear, sometimes terror, too. So um, Partly they're afraid of the present moment, the being hurt in their life now. But really the main Protection is against uh, hurts that are already there from the past. There's a lot of wounding. I mean, the heart is full of wounds and hurts and uh, rejections and all and all kind of things that are painful and difficult. But you know that that's not the only thing. Sometimes you know, one has love that is not acknowledged. They love somebody that wasn't reciprocated. Or they love their mother and father, and then the mother and father didn't see it, or they didn't recognize it, or misinterpreted it, and um, or judged it, or one thing or another. So sometimes it's love that is not, you know, not seen or recognized, and that person gets to experience that too. Do people really have a tough time when it comes to that period of being able to release? the feelings and emotions that are barriers to them? Yes. But people are different. You know, as you know, normal, people have had different kind of experience in their life. Everybody's different. Uh, They grew up in a different environment, different family, different situation, different opportunities. So some people have tougher time than others. So if somebody was... uh, abused or traumatized around love and loved ones, that makes it a lot more difficult than somebody who is just, you know, felt not loved as much or some they love their, their sibling more than of them. That's an issue that many people bring up, but that's not as tough as feeling their love was used to for sexual abuse or, or, or uh, you know, exploitation, something like that. That's more, that's much more difficult to deal with. So when we look at our reality, what is the physical world really? The physical world, I mean, there are many <laughs> views and different teaching about the, what is the physical world. Some teaching take the physical world to be a plane of reality, a real plane of reality, and there are other planes different spiritual or subtle some teaching especially what's called the non-dual teaching they think of the physical world the way we see it is not the way it is it is due is because we are experiencing it in uh, with the limitations of our beliefs and idea if we see it as it is we see it it's made out of light 
and awareness and love that the physical world is nothing but consciousness and in, in some very deep way and none will experience mean seeing the physical as not simply physical as it is uh, yeah. the um, the appearance of something uh, subtle something like consciousness or love well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Hamid Ali in regards to his new book, Non-Dual Love, Awakening to the Loving Nature of Reality. We'll be right back after these messages. The first thing you need to know about me is that I love my kids, but they are not my everything. They used to be, but that's when my entire life fell apart. In order to pick back up the pieces, I had to put the love I have for myself before everything else, including my kids. I'm Jessica Dennehy, and I own multiple businesses. I'm a best-selling author, and I have all the strategies that I've used to make my life what it is today. And I'm going to teach you how to do them in my new book, Selfish is a Superpower. So go get your copy today on Barnes & Noble or jessicadennehy.com. Announcing a revolutionary tool for wellness, Scalar Light has the ability to enhance and harmonize your own bio energies. With Scalar Light, you can get started in just minutes and begin feeling better the very next day. Scalar Light is a remote energy that gently and subtly works with your own body's bio energies, increases pro cellular wellness, and enhances your body's immunity. Experience the benefits of Scalar Light. Try a complimentary 15 day experience at scalarlight.com. In your hands lie ancestral patterns. These patterns shape how you think, what you struggle with, and experiences you love, your life pattern. We are going into the latest neuroscience of biological hand analysis, a realm beyond palmistry where science and the soul entwine. Hand analysis is the latest method to transform lifelong patterns. I am Master Hand Analyst Brent Bruning. Join us and visit thepowerinyourhands.com. Looking for a page turner? Cozy up to a fantasy adventure romance trilogy with The Girl in the Twall Wallpaper by Mary Kay Savaris. The second novel in the Star Writers trilogy, The Star Writers Club, is coming soon. Take the journey. Connect with Mary at www.marykaysavarese.com. Her books are available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. The book Terminal Cancer is a Misdiagnosis, authored by Danny Carroll, is on sale at Amazon now. Licensed psychologist and psychotherapist Tessa Antia John Guerra commented, This is one of the most empowering books on a topic of cancer you will ever read. Award-winning author T.L. Needham commented, This recommended book can be understood by anyone seeking answers, hope, and alternatives to a terminal diagnosis. Buy it now on Amazon.com. With Breath Hub, you'll experience the transformative power of breath as it harmonizes your body, mind, and spirit. Recommended by experts in fitness, sports, psychology, and medicine. Meet the scientific way of being well. Breath Hub. Breathe better. Live better. Pandemonium. Fast forward 20 years. A U.S. president seizes control of all U.S. missiles, the power grid, the banking system, and every computer in America as he hides in an underground bunker. Pandemonium, a captivating sci-fi thriller where a hidden war, psychics, aliens, artificial intelligence, and transcendental love collide with the latest media technology. Pandemonium, live to all devices. Get your copy on paperback or digital. Free sample at getpsychic.org. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com 
join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with our special guest, Hamid Ali, who's here to share with us his new book, Non-Dual Love, Awakening to the Loving Nature of Reality. In your book, you talk about how our identity is a mental construct of our beliefs and images that are associated with our emotional patterns. I'd love for you to expound on that for our listeners. You know, most people don't think about that. They think they know themselves. Oh, I am such and such a person. I was born on such and such date, and as my parents, and I went to college, I did this and that. And that's their identity. But, you know, when we explore deeper than that, we realize that belief, that identity has a lot in it of beliefs, of mental identification with think that we experienced in the past. Like what how our parents looked at us, what other people thought of us, how we experienced ourselves as children, and how we had to experience ourselves to identify we identify with the body for a long time for purposes of survival. We need to believe we are the body to survive physically. But I see that as a stage that people just most people don't go beyond. So it's a construct in the sense uh, the mind, what the mind does, is take all those impressions from the past and integrate them together into overall image of oneself with a feeling of self or identity. And that's what most people believe they are, what they are. If you go into the spiritual level, you realize that, no, that's all in your mind. That's not really real. What you are is pure presence of light and love. I would think some people have a hard time identifying just their human beings as an expression of love. Oh, yeah. No kidding. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's, but but it is normal. I mean, not just at the present time, all throughout all times, people see themselves as physical, as a body that has a mind. Even people who believe in soul or spirit, and they believe they have a soul instead of of being the soul. When you move on to the spiritual dimension of experience, you realize, no, I am the soul and the spirit, and I come through this body. Which is a different way of experiencing things, which is actually quite liberating, besides being beautiful. And I wish more people experience that, and there are people who do learn it. But it takes a great deal of learning, a great deal of surrendering of one's protective shield and uh, in one's own mind is not like with other people when people work with me I'm not trying to pit them against other who hurt them and work with their own experience and their own mind the fears and their own fears and uh, they're not they're not needed anymore it has to do with the past so it's a remnant of the past that people end up believing, and those remnants in the past are the underbelly, is the unconscious part of the usual sense of being a human being that most people take themselves to be. And that is not just me. All spiritual teaching recognize that. So when we talk about God and true nature, is that the same thing? Well, it depends, you see. And it depends on which teaching you're referring to. If you take the Buddhist or the Hindu teaching, it's not God, it is just true nature or spiritual nature. If you go to, to the Western world, into like uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, God is, is the ultimate uh, or the deepest uh, source of our spiritual nature. So, God is seen as the inner of the inner, as the source of all spirituality. 
instead of just so God is not just love, God is a lot more. God is the source of love for for uh, the Western traditions. I mean, for me, I take spiritual nature and God a different way, uh, words to talk about sort of the same thing with slightly different emphasis. Some people relate more to the word God to experience love or, or non-dual love. Some people have a problem with the word God, so they prefer through nature or spiritual nature. So I'm open to how people look at them, what's easy for them to. The, the point is to experience the actual light of love, whether regardless of what you call it. When you're really experiencing it, there's no reason to think, give it a name. Is this really inviting the reader and our listeners to maybe take a look at their personal relationship with God or the divine, however they choose to uh, call that? That part of uh, some people take that to uh, ask them what is their relation with the divine? Do they uh, do they believe there is such a thing? Are they open to it? Do they have sense of it? But also. And other people will see it as an invitation to see there is more to them than what they take themselves to be. That there is a deeper dimension than them that I call spiritual. When if they experience it, they experience it as their true self or the their soul or their uh, subtle dimension of their consciousness, and uh, that's the invitation to look deeper, to question oneself and contemplate one's experience, one way of relating to not just God or divine, but to everything. Do we relate to it from the perspective of being just like one kind of animal that we call a human being, or we are beings of light? I love that. The the diamond approach that you have developed, does that have roots in ancient practices? Well, it utilizes many ancient practices. And I study as many of the things. I studied the Suvi, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the many things. I had teachers and practiced many of those things. However, the diamond approach developed developed in its own, you know, and knowledge of those tradition, but also knowledge of uh, Western uh, modern psychology. I use a lot of uh, the finding of modern psychology that the ancient didn't have access to. And the two are integrated in a way that is that happened naturally and organically that developed into what I call uh, the diamond approach. So it is uh, contemporary teaching. In your book, you talk about surrendering, and I think a, a lot of times people may get that a little confused, when, especially when we bring in the discussion of divine love into that or God. What do you mean by surrendering? Yeah, it's a question that many people are uh, confused about. They take surrendering from the perspective of the physical, like like physically surrendering to another person, like an army surrendering to another army, rubbing your arms and letting yourself be, you know, to be defeated. Uh, sometimes surrendering, on a subtler level, people, they think surrendering is something they do. I mean, surrender means I say, okay, I won't resist, I won't protect myself, I will drop my protection, and that way, I will surrender or let go. That is how many people think of it, sometimes even experience it. But the true surrender is not something we do. It is like the grace of the divine. When we are ready, when we are open, a grace appears, and the grace basically dissolves the protection of the defenses, and we call that surrender. So what is grace then? And grace is the divine love appearing in our life, in our own experience. As if 
something coming from some other source, not us, and uh, melting us, impacting us, uh, softening us. It might appear inside or it appears as if it's showering us from outside. So uh, grace, of course, is like a blessing. But the blessing is the, the, the being showered with divine love itself. Now, in your book, you have a quote that I think it, it mean, makes sense, but I think a lot of people would also look at that going, okay, well, wait a minute. How does this pertain to my life? You talk about many of the difficult things that happen in our life or our lives are also blessings in disguise. And I'd love for you to expand on that. Yeah, so that's another uh, meaning of the word blessing or uh, grace, which is that many human beings have blessings in their life in the sense that um, they, they their life, things happen in their life, either they're born to a situation or encounter a situation in their life or opportunities that are sort of uh give them a better possibility of freedom of uh, happiness of uh of fulfillment in their life and that comes out of nowhere it's like uh, one can't explain it well how did they come into this good fortune i don't mean necessarily you know financial fortune although it can be that way but Many people have that good fortune, that good, uh, some people say luck, or destiny, or this and that. But it is really the action of grace that is where we don't see the force of grace. We just see the impact that it has in our life. Well, you touch on trauma within your book quite a bit, actually. And is there any positive aspects when we look at trauma? Trauma, I mean, nobody traumatized will think there's a positive aspect. Not at the beginning of recognizing and feeling it. It will be difficult to call it a positive aspect. However, I've worked with people who had trauma in their life by uh, embracing it and cha- uh, confronting it, or working with it, and resolving it. It becomes an opportunity for them to learn and mature and go deeper in themselves than they would have otherwise. So it, it can be an opportunity for growth and development. But for most people, the trauma is too hard to deal with, so it's hard to see it as an opportunity. But I know the people who've worked with it, they, they learn about themselves a lot. You know, they learn about their... I mean, to, to resolve trauma on a deep level, one has to go to their spiritual dimension because it's not enough to work with it uh, and if, uh, psychologically, which is how most trauma therapy ha- happen, which really helps a lot. However, for complete resolution, for completely for traumas and uh, traces to go away, one has to be, be learn to be their spiritual being, to recognize they are a being of light then trauma becomes something of the past. In some ways, I've heard that called like the lesson too. You know, it's it's something that will move us beyond our comfort zone. Yes. So when we talk about, you know, grace, we've been kind of sharing a little bit about grace. In your book, you want people to share with you an experience of grace that they've had. Why is that? Well, when you see the book, hasn't it some interaction I've had with the students? And sometimes part of the work, the inquiry, is for people to recognize the moment of grace they experience in their life so that they might have not so reflected on it, might not have focused on it. By recognizing it and embracing it, they might open up to further grace or to more direct recognition of the divine love that is behind the grace. There are many people experiencing grace in one kind or another in their life and know it consciously. Sometimes they don't know, they just feel their life is good, something good happened in it. They don't know why. 
how come they've been so lucky? If they recognize that, they might have the opportunity to go deeper in themselves, recognize what are the deeper forces that are making that possible. And that would allow them to also be a little bit more comfortable with divine love or God or however they choose to identify. Yeah, yeah. It makes them more comfortable, more open to it, and not scared of it, and be, yeah, comfortable. And then learning to be in that realm as part of human experience. That is, it is actually part of the human potential for everybody. And it's actualized by some. But every human being has that as their inherent potential if they have the way of opening up to it, of approaching it, that uh, by going through the fears and uh, and the hurts and going uh, going beyond them by embracing them, we embrace. Uh, we go through by embracing. That's the method. It is. Uh, yeah, so it's not a transcendence. It's not just a, a, a pushing it aside. It's going through it by uh, understanding it, by illuminating it. What are some of the questions you get asked often from your students? Well, some of the questions you ask. Well, how is non-dual different from usual experience? And sometimes if there is divine love where is it how come the world is a mess right it's an ordinary question many people ask me say well if there is god if god is loving or if there's love that pervades the universe where is it i i don't see it i see a lot of trouble love hatred love enmity so that's one question that people ask that may make them doubt the existence of such possibility or something like divine love, the way I write about it in the book. So how would you answer that question then? Because I, I think for a lot of people, that would be a difficult thing to overcome because the world is a hot mess right now. <laughs> no kidding, yeah. Well, uh, uh, the way, one way I answer it is by saying, well, if you look at the human body, you have all these cells, right? And organs and cells and all of that. On the cellular level, uh, you can get sick. You get can Some of the cells can become, become cancerous, right? However, if you look at it from the perspective of atoms, that everything is made out of atoms, the atoms are always perfect. They never have cancer. They never have illness. They're always the same atoms. So it's looking at the same thing from two dimension of itself. So the human body has the level of cellular level and have the atomic level. They're both uh, together. They're both the same in some sense, but looked at from, from different lenses. So divine love is like the atoms to the cells. The atoms, uh, but they are spiritual atoms, not... Uh, physical atom. This is just like a, I'm using a metaphor analogy to explain the relationship of an underlying nature like love or light to what we see outside us, which is a lot of trouble. There's some goodness in the world, of course. Otherwise, it won't survive, but there is a lot of trouble. And um, but that is seeing it from the perspective of the physical body. Some part of it is good, and most of the time it's healthy, sometimes it's sick, and Oh, that's true. However, on the level of atom, atoms are always atom, always perfect. So that's one way I answer it. That's a good way to put that. Thank you for sharing that with us. And it's a question I think a lot of people would have. So I appreciate you taking the time to go over that with us and talk with us about that. Yeah. In your book, you talk about guidance. Can you share on that for our listeners? In our in spiritual work, we become aware that there can be an inner guidance. You could say the guidance from the divine or guidance from our spiritual nature. And the guidance doesn't mean you should marry this person, not that person, which many people think guidance is, but that's what people go to psychic 
to <laughs> to tell them or the role or something like that. Guidance in a spiritual path is more a feeling, a recognizing which way to look, which way to go. It's more pointing, an arrow pointing in a direction, but not telling you with the end where it's going to go. So it tells us which way to go, where to put our attention, what to explore, or in our action, which action seems to be more aligned with our true nature. So it's a very intimate, subtle, and very close to our heart, the sense of uh, inner guidance. It's not like a voice in your mind telling you do this or do that. That's not guidance, what I mean by guidance. Inner guidance is an inner sense, almost intuitive, of a uh, sense of um, knowing the direction. So with the diamond approach, what would you like our listeners to know about that and your book? Well, to learn about the diamond approach, because there are many books that I've written under my name, people can go to our website where uh, many of the much of the teaching happened, which is downapproach.org. Go to diamondapproach.org, they'll see many of my talks, they will see ways of accessing the teaching, way of finding teachers and guides in the teaching. So we have groups all around the world and teachers all around the world who are trained to do this work. I've trained many people. I don't just do it by myself because our work, it's not enough for me to give a talk and give a teaching. But we need teachers to work individually, one-to-one -one with students, you know, and in a regular, ongoing way, sometimes it goes on for years, to, to help them find themselves, to give them a sense of guidance that in time become internalized until the student find their own guidance. I love that, my goodness. Well, it's such a just, I, I really was so impressed with your book, Non-Dual Love. And um, uh -huh. can you can you share your website with us one more time? Diamondapproach.org. Diamond Approach as one word. Diamondapproach.org. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Well, thanks, Marianne, for giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit about my book. And hopefully what I talked about by itself will be useful to the listeners. And if they read the book, they'll find out more details, you know. But hopefully the, the, this conversation hopefully can be useful, can help people reflect on themselves, open up, connect to something deeper in themselves. I'm just hoping it will be useful. Well, thank you, Hamid. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Non-Dual Love, Awakening to the Loving Nature of Reality. Non-Dual Love is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support your indie bookstores. If you don't see it on the shelf, just ask for them to order it. You can also pick up this book directly from the publisher, Shambhala at Shambhala.com. To learn more about Hamid's Diamond Approach, please visit his website, diamondapproach.org. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. 
Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.